in the budget. Order, Senator Dodson. It being 2 p.m. Thank you, Senator Cormann. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. Uh, Mr. President, I advise the Senate that Senator Birmingham will be absent from question time today uh, due to ministerial business overseas. In Senator Birmingham's absence, Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, and the Assistant Trade and Investment Minister, and Senator McKenzie will represent the Minister for Education, and Senator Canavan will represent the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction and the Minister for the Environment. Thank you, Senator Cormann. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In an article in today's Herald Sun entitled Liberals Told Liu Was Bad Idea, it has been reported that the Liberal Party was warned by intelligence agencies against pre selecting Ms. Liu for the seat of Chisholm prior to this year's federal election. Did the Prime Minister receive any advice about the current member for Chisholm? from government agencies before the May, May 18 election. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. I uh, thank Senator Wong for that question. Uh, obviously, uh, pre-selection matters uh, for all parties are matters uh, for party organisations. Uh, I'm not aware of any such uh, advice uh, having uh, been received, but um, in an abundance of caution to make sure uh, that uh, I'm 100 per cent accurate, uh, I'll take that question on notice uh, and provide an answer. Senator Wong. Has the Prime Minister or his office sought any advice from government agencies today following the publication of this story? And if not, why not? Senator uh, th Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I think that that is a rather irresponsible uh, question. And I, think that Senator, I think that Senator Wong uh, well knows uh, she's senior enough uh, in uh, this uh, uh, occupation uh, to know that uh, go no government ever comments on uh, the advice that or, uh, order Senator Wong on a point of order direct relevance. <coughs> this is a serious matter. The question does actually no not go to the content of the advice. It goes to whether the Prime Minister considered the Republic report so serious that he sought advice. I simply asked, has he sought advice, not what the advice was? I understand, Senator Wong, on the point of order, the minister has been speaking for 20 seconds. I'll allow him to continue. Senator Cormann. The, the Prime Minister has full confidence uh, in uh, the member for Chisholm. The, the Prime Minister has full confidence in the member for Chisholm, as he's indicated publicly. Uh, this is nothing but uh, an attempt at a Labor smear. Uh, and the double standard is quite uh, unbelievable. If you look at the Labor candidate for Chisholm in that same election, she was a member and an honorary uh, chairwoman of the same uh, organisation. She equally gave advice order. that she wasn't Senator aware that— Corman, Senator Wong on a point of order. I think it really is cowardly to smear somebody who's not even in the parliament. There is only on one per— Mr President, this goes to direct relevance. It goes to imputations as well. There is— there is Siri, there are serious national security questions raised by someone on the front page of the paper. You ought to respond, not smear someone who is not here to defend herself. On the point of order, or um, continuing, no, 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 Senator? I'm just, I'm continuing oh, so on the on, on, on the point of order, um, Senator Cormann, um, Senator Wong's reminded you of the nature of the yeah. question. Um, in this case, I believe the appropriate um, aspect of the supplementary relates to. Yeah. Um, the, na the, specific, the specific nature of the question rather than other yeah. people. Um, yeah. But put, put Senator, it yeah, Senator Cormann. I completely reject the proposition that Senator Wong has just made. There are not serious national security uh, issues at stake in relation to the member for Chisholm. This is, this is a clumsy interview of a new uh, backbencher who happens to be uh, an Australian of Chinese descent. The same as the Labor Order. candidate in Chisholm uh, was an Australian of Chinese descent. has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask a supplementary question. Has anyone in this government received any warnings in relation to Ms. Liu's suitability to sit as a member of the Australian Parliament? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. That is a disgraceful question. Uh, up, the, mem the member for Chisholm is absolutely suitable to be a member of this parliament, and was, she was elected as such, and she was elected as such uh, by the people of Chisholm, where she was facing a Labor candidate who equally uh, was uh, an Australian of Chinese uh, descent, who was a member of 
similar organisations, and indeed none other than the then Shadow Treasurer accepted hospitality uh, from the organisation that supposedly now is this major national security risk. This is a transparent a Labour smear against the Liberal Member of Parliament uh, in an electorate that, that, where order. they lost the election. Senator Wong on the point of order. There is, there are, I, I ask the Minister to return to the question, and I make the point again. The reports, and Senator Betts, I would have thought you would have taken this seriously. The point of order is direct relevance. The front page of the papers assert that there were intelligence warnings about a person. How is it a smear um, to I ask what you have done about that? S Senator Wong, I believe with respect that is a debating point. I believe the minister is being directly relevant. I cannot instruct him how to answer a question nor the content of it. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. We all know how things get into newspapers in this business. And let me just say, let me just say again what I've said before. The Prime Minister has full confidence uh, in the member for Chisholm, as the people of Chisholm expressed their confidence uh, in the member for Chisholm at the last election. All this is about it's, this is still the seven stages of grief that the Labour Party is going through after the last election. The Order. seven stages of grief. You can't accept the fact that you lost the election and you lost the election in Chisholm too. Order. 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 I would like to make a, a brief statement to the chamber. The statement I'm about to make is not a reflection on the previous question, but I'm going to take this opportunity to remind senators of two elements in the standing orders. Standing Order 73 says questions shall not contain imputations. Standing Order 1933 includes the following phrase. All imputations of improper motives and all personal reflections on, the, on those houses, that includes the other house of this parliament, members or officers, shall be considered highly disorderly. So while I'm not making an observation on the previous question, I would like senators to keep that in mind when asking questions about any matter that may, may involve an imputation or an improper reflection upon a member of another place. Senator Wong. Answering, sir. A, 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 answer, Sorry, it's that not applies the, the standing to orders. Quite right. Thank you. That, that implies to the answering questions. The imputation was in the answer with respect. That, that, um, no. I'm not making an observation on either the, that question or that answer. I'm just providing a preemptive warning to the Senate that the standing orders are very strict when it comes to reflections or imputations on members of either house. Um, we've let the issue of imputation slip a little more generally, but on that issue I think it needs to be applied strictly. It can be avoided through the careful wording of questions and answers. Senator Fawcett. Thank you. My question is to the Foreign Minister, Senator Payne. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the matter of Australians who are detained in Iran? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Fawcett uh, for his question. Uh, I can advise the Senate, and there has been uh, media reporting on this matter, Mr. President, that three Australians are being held in prison in Iran. This is a matter of deep concern to the government, to me personally as Foreign Minister, and I know to the people of Australia. They relate to two separate cases. One involves an Australian woman who has been detained for a number of months. The second concerns a young couple who have been detained now for a number of weeks. Since they were detained, the Australian government has been pressing the Iranian government for their release. I have communicated with my Iranian counterpart, Foreign Minister Zarif, many times about these cases, including through face-to-face -face meetings. We met as recently as last week. I will maintain my practice of many years by uh, keeping the contents of my discussions with Foreign Minister Zarif private, uh, but I will say that a central topic of our meetings has been the three Australians. The families of the two detained Australians have released of two of the detained Australians have released a statement saying they hope to see their loved ones safely home as soon as possible. The families have no further comment at this time and ask that the media respects their privacy. I know I join others in this place in saying that we too hope a speedy return for these Australians from Iran. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, could you update the Senate on what the Australian government is doing to support these three Australians and their families? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I want to acknowledge those officials uh, who have been working uh, with me very hard behind the scenes to secure the release of these three Australians. The government has been making efforts to ensure they are treated fairly, humanely, and in accordance with international norms. We also continue to provide consular assistance to the three Australians' families with whom we have maintained regular contact. 
On the basis of ongoing discussions, I continue to believe that the best chance of a successful outcome for these three Australians is with Iran through diplomatic channels and not through the media. We will always, always act in the best interests of the Australians and their families. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, could the minister update the Senate on any other aspects of these cases? Senator Payne. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, DFAT officials have had several meetings with the Iranian ambassador in Canberra. Sure. Our embassy in Tehran has made repeated representations to very senior Iranian officials in Tehran. Given these conversations and the timing of the arrests, I can say these arrests do not relate to broader <laughs> issues. We have no reason to think that these arrests are connected to international concern over Iran's nuclear program, United Nations sanctions or sanctions enforcement, or maritime security and the safety of civilian shipping. I would finally like to remind Australians of the importance of consulting the DFAT Smart Traveller website. DFAT's travel advice for Iran is reconsider your need to travel. The highest level of do not travel applies in some parts of the country. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I refer to reports in today's Herald Sun that the Liberal Party was warned against pre selecting Ms. Liu for the seat of Chisholm. When the Prime Minister proclaimed, How good is Gladys Liu at her campaign launch? Was he aware of any concerns regarding Ms. Liu's suitability to sit as a member of the Australian Parliament? The Minister representing the Prime Minister. Senator Thank Cormann. you very much, Mr. President. I completely reject the premise of the question. The Prime Minister has full confidence in the suitability of uh, the member for Chisholm to sit in Parliament. Senator Keneally, supplementary question. When the Prime Minister and Ms. Liu raised their hands together following her first speech, was he aware of any concerns regarding Ms. Liu's suitability to sit as a member of the Australian Parliament? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Ms. Liu, uh, the member for Chisholm, is an absolutely outstanding individual. She's Senator, a great uh, Australian. Senator, I, I was just Se asked about the Senator Cormann. Senator Wong, on a point of order? Point of order is direct relevance. No one asked Senator Cormann whether to give a character reference in relation to the member for Chisholm. In fact, we didn't put that to her. We asked a very specific, a very specific question was whether or not the Prime Minister, at the time that Senator Keneally referenced, had any, was aware of any concerns regarding her suitability. It is a very specific uh, question. Uh, 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 and Senator Wong, he, the he answer been, will then he, say no. He, he has been, if I could rule, the Minister has been speaking for eight, eight seconds, and I, I don't believe he'd completed a, a, a sentence. I will listen carefully to his answer. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. As I've already indicated uh, in response to the primary question, the Prime Minister does not have uh, any concerns about Ms Liu's suitability to be uh, the uh, Member of Parliament. And indeed, uh, Ms Liu is an outstanding Australian. She's an outstanding Australian. She came here as a migrant uh, who has done exceptionally well. Uh, working as a speech pathologist in the Victorian Department of uh, Education Early Childhood, having uh, opened up her own uh, business and managed a res restaurant as a small business, uh, um, um, working in a small business, president of the Box Hill Chess Club, special advisor to the Victorian Premier on Chinese affairs, um, head of development and corporate social responsibility advisor for Canaan Lawyers. I mean, she is, she is somebody who's come here as a uh, migrant to Australia. She's worked hard. Uh, she's done her best. She's put herself forward uh, for consideration by the people Order. of Chisholm, Senator and Coleman, she won the election. Time for the answers expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Media reports indicate that Ms. Liu's office is forwarding all media inquiries to the Prime Minister's office, and Ms. Liu's statement was drafted by the Prime Minister's office. Are these reports correct? Senator uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Ms. Liu. Uh, issued a statement yesterday in her name that's her statement uh, it's on the public record and and again i mean this is i mean this is this is the labor party this is this is the labor party pursuing a smear against the recently elected member of power just because they're still going through their seven stages of grief not having won a seat they thought they already had in their pocket they thought they were absolutely do you think the labor party would be asking the same questions uh, if the labor candidate in chisholm had won that election who was a member of the same organization senator keneally on a point of order 
Direct relevance, uh, Mr. President. The question was very specific to ask the minister if the reports in the media today are correct that Ms. Liu's office is forwarding all media inquiries to the Prime Minister's office and Ms. Liu's statement was drafted by the Prime Minister's office. Um, Senator, on, on the point of order about direct relevance, I said earlier that um, at this, the minister did not breach this, um, that observations about other people were not in order with specific questions. The question did reference the statement. I heard the minister talking about the statement. I believe that is relevant. I can't instruct him how to answer the question. Um, and if I, might, if I might be honest and say uh, a glancing statement that is political in an answer would not be foreign to this particular chamber, but I am listening very carefully to his answer. I believe he was talking about the statement and that is directly relevant. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. As I've indicated, the, the member for Chisholm uh, issued a statement that's on the public record, but I make the broader point. I make the broader point that the only reason the Labor Party is pursuing this smear is, is pursuing order. this smear. Senator Wong, on a point of order. The questions went to whether or not the reports that Ms Liu's office were forwarding all media inquiries to the PMO and that her statement was drafted by the PMO were correct. That, that was, they were the only questions asked. That was the only yeah. question asked. I would ask you, Mr President, that is more than glancing. He has refused to even touch the, second, the, the question as to whether the reports that the PMO drafted the statement and was dealing with media inquiries are correct. You have reminded the Minister of the answer, Senator Wong. I cannot instruct him how to answer a question. He is required to be directly relevant, and as I have said before, um, a glancing comment might be in order, but it is not appropriate to talk about others when the question, when the question is so specific. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. As I have said several times now, as I've said several times now uh, there is a statement that was issued by the member for Chisholm in her, under her authority, her name, her authority, and it is her statement presenting her story and Order. if the Labor Party Senator actually Cormann. took the time for the answer has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, my question is to Senator Rustin, the Minister for Family and Social Services. In a recent article from Tuesday's Sunday Morning Herald, Toby Hall, Chief Executive of St Vincent's Health Australia, said of the government's proposal to drug test income support recipients, there is not one shred of evidence here or overseas that shows compulsory drug testing works to help someone on a path to beating their drug problem in the long term. This policy would be about counterproductive because it stigmatises people. We know stigmatisation is one of the biggest barriers to people asking for help, and any increase in stigma and anxiety for people with substance use disorders will exacerbate their addiction rather than help them. Despite unanimous opposition from the health and addiction sector, the government once again is, has introduced legislation to drug test income report support recipients. Minister, what makes the government think they know better than the experts and why is Australia any different from overseas failed experiences of drug testing? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much and I thank Senator Seward for her question and acknowledge her ongoing and enduring interest in uh, speaking on behalf of more vulnerable Australians. Um, can I say right from uh, the, the outset here, the Morrison government is absolutely committed to supporting people um, into getting them into a position where they're job ready. And part of that process is being able to identify the barriers that they face in being able to get a job. And one of the more significant barriers we know that people who are unemployed face in being able to get themselves into a job is drug addiction or substance abuse. We know from statistics that somebody who is unemployed is about three, more than three times more likely um, to actually have an addiction to ice. We know that people who are unemployed are more likely to uh, smoke cannabis than those people who are employed. But what we're seeking to do here by this drug trial, should it be successful in passing through this place, is to identify people who have a drug or substance abuse problem. Um, and if they fail on the first count to, to pass a drug test, uh, we would seek to um, restrict or quarantine an amount of their payment so that they could only access— Order. Senator Seward, on a point of order. <clears throat> well, I appreciate the information the minister is providing. I have heard it before, um, but I asked a very specific question. Why does the what makes the government think that they know more than the experts you, you, who are saying this doesn't work? Senator Seward, you've restated the question at the end 
of a longer, a longer question that had a substantial preamble and various facts included. The minister is being directly relevant if she speaks to those as well. Um, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer the question. I call the minister to continue. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. What I would stress here is this is a trial. A part, the reason that we have trials is so that we can gather a body of evidence so that we can make more informed decisions. This government is absolutely committed to finding new and in innovative ways by which we can assist people who are unemployed to break down their barriers to get into work. This particular trial is exactly that. It is a trial and it is intended for us to be able to gather that body of evidence so that we can, um, can uh, put new programs in place that are innovative and responsive to the conditions that individuals find and the barriers that individuals find in Order, getting Senator into work. Rustin. Senator C, what a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. A Monash University study on the health status of Newstart recipients released earlier this week shows nearly half of Newstart recipients report having mental or behavioural problems. How does drug testing help people with mental health issues when it is linked to increased stigma? Senator Rustin. Hmm. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and thanks Senator Seawood for her follow-up question. Um, as I said in, the, in my response to my, my primary question, the absolute core reason and, and, and motivation behind the Morrison government seeking to ask this place to give us the mandate to be able to go out and undertake a very limited number of drug trial um, testing on new people who are coming on uh, to, to, um, to New Start is so that we can identify whether that this drug addiction or substance abuse is actually the barrier that is preventing them from being able to get into work. And if it turns out that they have got a substance issue, then we will then have the opportunity to be able to provide them with the kind of support services, facilities and treatments that will enable them to be able to address their drug or substance abuse issue. This is about helping Australians because we know that one of the most important barriers that we can break down for people who are looking for work is drug addiction. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator C, what a final supplementary question. Isn't this forced debate around drug testing income support recipients really just about diverting attention around from, away from the fact that the New Start allowance needs to be raised? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Seawatt. Um, this is not new. The, the concept um, of tr um, drug testing for, for New Start recipients to, uh, to identify if this is a barrier for their employment has been around for some time. Um, I think it was first introduced into this place um, some nearly three years ago, and it has subsequently been introduced again. So we have already had um, a, a quite a long period of time where this issue has been something that this government has had on the table as one of its responses of a suite of measures that we want to put in place to assist Australians who find themselves without a job being able to break down those barriers so that they can get into a job. So, uh, Senator Seawood, I can absolutely um, categorically state to you that the reason behind and the motivation behind the Morrison government in seeking to convince this place of the benefits and the value of this trial is being able to assist people who find themselves with a barrier to work caused by drug addiction to get over that barrier so they can get a job. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Yesterday in question time, the minister refused to assure the Senate that the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to be a member of the Australian Parliament. Why? Senator Payne. It's absolutely a, a, a misrepresentation of my position, uh, Mr President. The suggestion that uh, the member for Chisholm is not a fit and proper person uh, is insulting. It is uh, the case that she's an active member of her local community, that she works closely with many groups, including from across the Chinese Australian community. Uh, in her statement yesterday, uh, which uh, she is on the public record, and I read part of that to the Senate yesterday, Mr. President, uh, she was uh, clear and open about her previous associations that have been the subject of media inquiries, associations that she no longer holds. Uh, she has proactively disassociated herself with various groups that have appointed her to honorary roles without her knowledge or consent, as is uh, often the practice with uh, Chinese associations. The member for Chisholm, Mr. President, is a proud Australian. She's passionately committed to serving the people of Chisholm, and any suggestion to the contrary is deeply offensive. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Has the minister sought information from relevant agencies 
or from other ministers or their officers to assure herself of Ms Liu's fitness to be a member of the Australian Parliament? Thank Senator you, Mr Payne. President. I'm not going to comment on my engagement on intelligence matters and I'm not going to comment on my private conversations with colleagues. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister now unequivocally assure the Senate that the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to be a member of the Australian Parliament? Senator Payne. Mr President, I have uh, said that now twice. I am not sure quite what it is that Senator Kitching seeks to imply. If Senator Kitching and those opposite are intending to advance an alternative proposition, then they should actually say it. If they are not, then they should stop endeavouring to smear a member of the House of Representatives. If they are uncomfortable about their own associations historically with similar organisations, if they are uncomfortable about evidence that comes out in the Independent Commission Against Corruption in New South Wales, which I have order. seen week in Senator and week Payne, out as a New South Wales a, Senator, Senator Kitching, that is not on a my point problem, of order. Mr Senator President. Payne, please. Senator Kitching, on a point of order. Mr President, mine is on relevance but also on um, misleading the chamber. I'm not sure that Senator Payne actually has said that Ms Liu, the member for Chisholm, is a fit and proper person, yet but Senator Payne, at the beginning of her I'll answer to the second Senator supplementary— Kitching, I'll ask you to come to your point on relevance. Um, claims like the one you're making now are debating points that are not appropriate for points of order. You're going to make a point about direct relevance. Well, on relevance, I've asked if she is a fit and proper person and if the minister is able to give that assurance. A couple of observations I'll make at this point. We do need to be careful about asking ministers when it is not directly their portfolio responsibility or agency responsibility, nor is it in the authority of any minister to determine someone's eligibility um, or their fit and proper status necessarily, other than in a vernacular sense, to sit in the parliament. I'll allow the minister to continue to answer the question, uh, draw her to the question and remind people of my previous ruling about commenting on other people. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. I had concluded my answer. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, my question is to Senator Mackenzie, representing the Minister for Water Resources. Mr Littleproud has announced that the government will spend in excess of $1 billion on directing a further 450 gigalitres of so-called environmental flows into the Murray-Darling Basin, known as Sustainable Diversion Adjustment Mechanism. This is water that would have otherwise been retained for agriculture or for groundwater replenishment. The Australian National Audit Office is currently conducting an inquiry into the procurement of strategic water entitlements, with their report due in December. Will the minister pause the SDI program until the audit report is made available and any recommendations are reflected in an updated Murray-Darling Basin plan? The minister representing the Minister for Water Resources, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much and thank you, Senator Roberts, for your question and your ongoing interest in ensuring the Murray-Darling Basin uh, plan rollout uh, meets the needs of irrigators, the environment and the communities contained within the basin. As Minister Littleproud has made very clear, our government continues to work with state governments uh, to roll out the plan in a way that least impacts on the ongoing financial viability of our agriculture sector and the communities that service that sector. Uh, and they're going through a very, very tough time. In your home state, sections of the Murray-Darling Basin um, proper have been in drought for upwards of six years. Uh, right throughout the basin in New South Wales, again, drought is biting hard. Drought is biting hard, and it is difficult to have enough flows uh, for high security and low security uh, water entitlement holders when there is not the water in the basin, enough water in the basin to go round. To that end, uh, we have been able to negotiate uh, with Minister Littleproud securing agreement from state governments around a socio-economic detriment test uh, before any further water is to be removed from basin communities. And that actually ensures that there can be uh, no further negative social outcomes economic outcomes of these basin communities before more water is taken out. And that is incredibly important because these communities are doing it tough at the moment and we need to ensure 
uh, that their ongoing viability is uh, secured, not just for those towns and that business, but indeed uh, for the broader export task and uh, sustainability of our nation's economic position and the, the role that agriculture and the Murray-Darling Basin producers play in that. Order. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister Littleproud has himself announced a $30 million inquiry into the science behind the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Does the minister consider it appropriate to understand what the government is doing before doing it? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, Senator Roberts. Um, government always uh, seeks to use the very best science available on which to make policy decisions. Um, and you will recall this process was set in place and uh, many, many years ago. And it has required state governments to also uh, do a lot of work on constraints, etc., uh, within their own jurisdictions. I remember when the plan first came into place, and we were going to flood the bar. Didn't realise that the Barma Choke was actually going to be the, even be the constraint that it is on moving the volume of water that needs to go from one end of the basin to the other. So a lot of work has been done by state governments in all the jurisdictions affected and government agencies to ensure that uh, we are making the best decisions possible uh, given the available science. So that will continue. And it is not just, it is not just um, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority Order, who's Senator McKenzie. Oh. Senator Roberts, a, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Murray-Darling Basin Plan has driven farmers to a class action lawsuit against the Murray-Darling Basin Authority seeking damages of $750 million. And last Thursday, 4,000 farmers protested on the banks of the Murray at Tokenwall against their water being sent to South Australia, as some people say, recreational flows. They even threw an effigy of Minister Littleproud into the river. How much stronger does the opposition need to be before the minister pauses or kills the plan? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Roberts. And indeed, uh, 1,500 uh, Victorian and New South Wales irrigators did gather in Tokemore, um to express their views about how the Murray-Darling plan was being rolled out. It is tough out there. It is incredibly tough. And it is as a result of the not enough water being available in the consumptive pool to be distributed in a way that ensures farmers are able uh, to grow their crops, uh, communities are able to um, survive and indeed the environment to get the water it needs and that it was agreed to get. So at the end of the day, our government is committed to delivering the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, bearing in, mind, bearing in mind we sought to make significant changes to the original plan that was put forward, which would have seen double the water taken out of these communities. Uh, and so Order. we don't want Senator one more McKenzie, gigalitre to time for the answer leave. expired. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Today is Are You OK Day? Every year, Are You OK Day starts an important conversation about suicide prevention across Australia. Can the minister please advise the Senate what steps the Morrison government is taking to support worthy causes like Are You OK Day and deliver support for Australians in managing their mental health? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I do thank Senator Antic for what yet again this week is a very important question. Are You OK uh, does fantastic work, I think we would all agree, uh, providing national focus and leadership for suicide prevention in Australia. Uh, this is such an important day today, and certainly I had the discussion with my staff this morning, because it draws national attention to how important it is to reach out to family, friends and colleagues and just ask them, are you OK? The government has provided funding for Are You OK through the Department of Health's National Suicide Prevention Leadership and Support Program. Sadly, more than half of all Australian adults know someone who died by suicide. As we know, suicide causes hurt, it causes loss and it causes pain for those who are left behind. The carnage at Rex does not discriminate and it extends, as we know, far beyond individuals to the communities and families left behind. I think it would be the position of all of us here in this chamber that no person should have to suffer through the isolation and despair that mental illness is capable of causing while feeling that there is no solution, 
without failing, there could be and there are brighter days to follow. Without feeling that not only is it possible that things will improve, but that you will be supported through the process of recovery. We know that simply reaching out and asking, are you OK, can make a massive difference in people's lives. The Morrison government is committed to improving the mental health of all Australians. We have adopted a towards zero target for suicide prevention. And whilst we acknowledge that this is a bold goal when we talk of setting objectives in this space, there is, again, I think, as we would all agree, no other acceptable option. Senator Antic, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, are there any further investments the government is making to address this important issue? Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President. And the answer is yes, there are. We currently, as a government, invest over $5 billion in mental health services each year across Australia. We have announced a $503 million youth mental health and suicide prevention plan. This is something that the Prime Minister is incredibly passionate about, and it is the largest suicide prevention plan in Australia's history. It's all about ensuring that families, communities and those facing challenges get the support that they need. We're undertaking a major expansion of the Headspace network, a significant boost to Indigenous suicide prevention and early childhood and parenting support. We will also trial eight adult mental health centres focusing on specialised support for adults requiring treatment, particularly after hours. And we have focused on eating disorders, uh, eating disorders, which many people don't know are actually the deadliest of psychiatric Order. conditions. Senator, yeah. Senator Antic, a final Amazing. supplementary That's question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what steps can we take as individuals to help tackle the stigma surrounding mental health? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, whilst enormous progress has been made on ending the stigma, people's self-consciousness about their own mental health concerns they still remain high. We know that this is actually the main barrier to people who want to actually they want to seek uh, help, but they just can't confront that self-consciousness. Uh, through Are You OK Day and other awareness-raising initiatives, we hope that more Australians will understand the warning signs for suicide. They'll know how to start a positive conversation with someone who is struggling, but also have that power to assist them to actually go out and access help. By making a real change in the prevalence of mental ill health and rates of suicide uh, in this country, it is going to require us all to take a collective effort. It is up to each and every one of us. So, it is our responsiveness that gives us together an opportunity to intervene. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Minister, the Moss Review was highly critical of the Department of Agriculture as a regulator of live exports, and there is immense public concern about the cruelty of live animal exports. Despite this, your department has recently refused a Freedom of Information request um, RSPC, from RSPC Australia for footage aboard the 2018 voyage from MV Al Shuaik on which 609 sheep, and I repeat, 609 sheep died, including many deaths from smothering. Does the minister consider it appropriate for this footage to be hidden from the public? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. I was, thank you, Senator Faruqi. Um, the the Department of Agriculture is the regulator of live animal exports in this country, as you know, and they take that role incredibly seriously. We as a nation can be confident that our system we've put in place in response to the Moss Review, in response to the McCarthy Review, which uh, were, were instigated as a result of the horrific voyage um, from last year, the Awasi Express, uh, has been very, very strong action and has resulted in significant changes in behaviour uh, by many animal uh, exporters. We've seen in the mortality rates, uh, they're down to 0.1 per cent, which is astounding uh, given the trigger for investigation is at 1 per cent of voyage. And that's as a result of changes in stocking density, making order. sure the Senator animals McKenzie. have— Senator McKenzie. Senator Faruqi on a point of order. Thank you, Mr President. My point of order is to direct relevance. I did ask half the time has passed. I did ask about the specific voyage and about specific 
footage that um, the department has refused to release, and I'm asking the minister if she thinks it's appropriate for that footage to be hidden from the public. Senator Fruki, you've reminded the minister of the question. Um, I'll continue listening very carefully. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Faruqi, I'll take the details of that particular voyage and footage on notice and get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, but with respect to um, the decreases in mortalities we've seen as a result of the tough action taken by this government last year, uh, we've seen a significant improvement, and that's been the change to stocking densities, so animals are able to have more room and air around, but they're also able to access food and water uh, whenever they need, rather than in um, a restricted manner. And that, as we've seen, has led to not only lower mortality rates, but indeed uh, higher animal welfare outcomes. Our government is absolutely committed to ensuring that Australians can have confidence that both the live sheep and live cattle industries are conducted with appropriate animal welfare standards and can continue to employ the thousands of Australians that they do. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Um, thank you, Mr President. Minister, I might enlighten you. Your department rejected the request for footage because and one of the reasons they gave was it might lead to criticism of the live animal export industry. Minister, have you or your staff discussed this FOI request with the Department of Agriculture? And if so, what was the nature of those discussions or correspondence? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, um, Mr. President. Well, Senator, as the department is the independent regulator, it would be, uh, you know, not appropriate for myself uh, nor my office to be discussing an independent investigation. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, more than 600 sheep have died and thousands more actually fought for space as they suffered in extreme heat. The independent observer noted that sheep could barely breathe for eight long hours. So could the minister rule out that there has been any involvement from her office or her in preventing the footage from being released? Senator McKenzie. Well, again, uh, Senator Faruqi, uh, not from me. Uh, they are the independent regulator and, uh, as such, they make decisions around how uh, the trade is regulated and investigated uh, within their own purvey. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In question time yesterday, the Prime Minister refused to assure the Parliament that the member of Chisholm is a fit and proper person to sit in the Australian Parliament, instead hiding behind Ms Liu's statement. Why? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Corbyn. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr President. I completely reject that proposition. I think any Australian who has watched the Prime Minister stand right behind the member for Chisholm and again today, as uh, Senator Cash rightly points out, knows that the Prime Minister has full confidence in the member for Chisholm. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. I ask a supplementary. Has I ask a supplementary question. Has the Prime Minister sought information from relevant agencies or from other ministers or their officers to assure himself of Ms Liu's fitness to be a member of the Australian Parliament? Senator uh, Cormann. Th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the Prime Minister has full confidence in the member for Chisholm. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. I ask the Minister, on behalf of the Prime Minister, to give this chamber an unequivocal assurance that the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to be a member of the Australian Parliament. I ask him to give that specific assurance. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. As I've said on a number of occasions uh, now, uh, as I've said on a number of occasions now, uh, Gladys Liu, who has been elected as the member for Chisholm by the people of Chisholm, uh, consisted with all of the requirements under our constitutions and our electoral laws, defeating the Labor candidate who was a member of uh, similar organisations, <coughs> or in fact the same organisations, uh, and having made similar observations of not having been aware that she had been made a, uh, an honorary uh, chairwoman order. and, Senator and the like. on a point of order. Direct relevance. I asked a very specific question. I asked this minister, representing the Prime Minister, to give an assurance that the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to be in the parliament. I ask him to give that assurance. On this point of order, you've restated the question, Senator Wong. Um, there, 
That is not a legal test. I'm, I'm using those words in the vernacular sense because that is not a legal test, nor is it a matter for anyone to determine someone's eligibility in this parliament, only the court or indeed this chamber, uh, referring it such. Therefore, in this case, because that is a question asked not in the legal meaning of that term, I believe the minister is being directly relevant when he's speaking this way. Senator Cormann. Let me say it to you again, very slowly. The Prime Minister has full confidence in the member for Chisholm. And, and you know what? The, 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 Labor, the, Labor, the Labor Party is thinking they can run any smear, any smear, and, and that is somehow going to reverse the result, the democratic result, at the last election in the seat of Chisholm or elsewhere. This is what this is all about. You're going through your seven stages of grief. You're not accepting the verdict of the Australian people. You're trying to smear a great Australian who has come here as a migrant who's worked very hard and who has been endorsed Order. by the people Senator of Chisholm Cormann. at the last election. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Mackenzie. Can the minister please update the Senate on the importance of the Liberal National Government delivering stability and certainty for students in rural, regional and remote Australia? The minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Senator Macdonald, for your question. The Morrison McCormick government believes that every Australian child, no matter where they live, should be able to access a world-class education. And that's why we're providing record funding for childcare at $8.6 billion, rising to $9.9 billion in childcare centres from um, Bangama in the north to Dover in Tassie south. That's why we're providing record funding for schools, $310 billion over 10 years, an increase of 62 per cent per student. And that's why we're providing record funding for universities, over $17 billion this year alone. But we need to ensure that we've got the policies and strategies in place to ensure that all Australians can reach their potential, irrespective of their geography. It's why our government instigated the Halsey Review, which actually formed part of the $152 million regional student access to education package to improve opportunities for those young people who live outside capital cities. Since 2016, the Liberal and the Nationals have committed more than half a billion dollars in new funding to improve regional higher education facilities um, and places, regional university centres, income support and scholarships for rural kids. And we're not done. At the National Press Club, Dan T and the Education Minister released the NAPFEEN review with 33 recommendations about how we as a government and a country can ensure that country kids can access higher education at the same rate as their city cousin. It is not because they lack the potential. It is because uh, cultural issues around lack of aspiration, achievement, which goes to the provision of quality services right from childcare through our state school systems uh, in regional and country towns. And it is about access, whether they need financial support to study in capital city universities or whether they can access Order, it right Senator there at McKenzie. home. Senator Macdonald, supplementary question. Can the minister please advise the Senate what the government is doing to support teachers in very remote Australia and to support school communities affected by drought and flood? Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much. Firstly, I want to say uh, it looks like we're in for a hard summer when it comes to the drought, with no respite uh, in sight uh, for coming months. We understand that education is vital for wellbeing, physical, social and economic. And that goes for families, communities and individuals. It's why we're supporting schools affected by natural disasters as well as drought. We provided $4 million in the special circumstances funding for 25 non-government schools affected by floods in North Queensland earlier this year. Affected schools across the state are supporting students, their families and staff. The cost of this assistance has, been adversely, has adversely affected other schools' finances. Special circumstances funding will help maintain schools' viability in the face of mounting costs. Teachers who complete four years of training in a very remote school will be eligible to have part of their help debt paid. This will be available to teachers who start their four year stint early. And we're also supporting childcare centres affected Order by floods. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator Macdonald, the final supplementary question. Minister, how is the government supporting universities in regional Australia? Senator Mackenzie. Thank you. We're supporting the government by providing record funding to Australia's university sector because access is fundamental for young people to reach their potential. 
Our government have committed more than a billion dollars in additional funding, $39.2 million for 21 regional university centres across uh, regional and remote Australia. We've got $83 million commitment to improve income support for regional students as part of our uh, strategy for them to access uh, education. We've got sub-bachelor and enabling places at university because often for regional students they're lacking that connecting piece between the ending of their secondary school education and beginning a bachelor degree. We're making sure that international students aren't just uh, getting an Australian experience in Melbourne and Sydney, but encouraging them to not only study world-class soil science, but also to be able to go surfing in the afternoon at some of our beautiful beaches. And we're also investing in rural and regional enterprise scholarships to ensure that country kids can access higher education by giving them the financial Order, Senator support. Senator McKenzie, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I refer to an article published by the ABC last night entitled Guests on Gladys Liu's List for Malcolm Turnbull Event Sparked ASIO Concerns, which reports that former Prime Minister Turnbull cancelled his attendance at a function organised by Ms Liu following the vetting of the guest list by security agencies. Can the minister confirm the former Prime Minister, Mr Turnbull, cancelled his attendance at that event? Senator Corbyn. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. I cannot confirm that, and you also know. Uh, that, uh, consistent with long-standing practice, that no government comments uh, on uh, advising from security order. agencies. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Direct relevance and a direct and, and a, a misrepresentation of the question. The question did not go to security advice. That is, in the report, we simply asked whether or not Mr. T the minister could confirm if Mr. Turnbull cancelled his attendance. Sen this government is hiding behind Wong, a convention about intelligence Wong, to avoid scrutiny. Senator Rebetz, I am surprised Senator, at you. Order, Senator Wong. I've, I, I, I've given you some liberality in raising that point of order and restating the question, but the minister is being directly relevant to the question. Even if he is not answering it in the preferred manner, I am not capable of instructing him to do so. Senator Cormann. You've concluded your answer. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Has the Prime Minister sought or received advice from government agencies about that report? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I refer the honourable senator to my previous answers. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Has Prime Minister Morrison's office continued the process that was in place in former Prime Minister Turnbull's office with respect to vetting of guest lists by intelligence agencies? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, we do not comment on uh, security agency arrangements. Senator O'Sullivan. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister please update the Senate Order. On, the, on the government's plan to help job seekers secure stability and certainty in a job, including through the proposed drug testing initiative? I, I remind senators to maintain their silence during questions being asked so that I'm, I may hear them, and particularly when I'm saying things from the chair, Senator Watt. Senator Rustin. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I thank the Senator for his question and his particular ongoing interest, even before he came into this place, on initiatives that focus on supporting people um, who are coming onto welfare to make sure that they get a stable and ongoing job? Because we know that people that are on welfare are denying themselves the best opportunity to be able to take advantage of the jobs that are being created. The, um, the, this Order. government has a very proud record of creating jobs. Over 1.4 million, jobs, Order 1 on million my jobs have been created since this government came into office, and we have a plan. We have a plan to create many, many more whilst we're in government. But the reality that we all need to face is that a small proportion of job seekers require additional support to get work ready. That is why the drug trial testing is being introduced by this government. It is not a punitive measure, as those officers would think it is. It is an initiative designed to help job seekers to remove the barriers to employment. So, By reforming the welfare system, we need to make sure there are strong incentives for people with a substance abuse issue to get treatment, to rehabilitate, so that they are in a position to be able to find a job. I want to make it very, very clear, very clear. 
No one who tests positive to a drug test will lose one cent of their welfare payment. Rather, if they fail that test, a person would be placed on income management, which quarantines 80 per cent of their income support, so it can only be spent on life's essentials, such as food, housing, clothing, rather than on drugs. And we know that drugs are the currency, uh, know that cash is the currency of drug dealers, and we want to deny them that currency. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate how this initiative will be beneficial to the workplace? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much. Um, the, the drug testing trial actually is a, an Australian first initiative, despite what others might say. And we are always out there looking for new and innovative ways to, to, to deal with the devastating impact that drugs have on individuals, their families, their communities, and the whole of Australia. Pleased to advise the Senate that this morning um, I took a, a drug test, and uh, anybody in this place is welcome to go and have a drug test. They're in this building, but the main reason that they're here is so you can go and assure yourselves of the process of undertaking a drug test. It's very, very commonplace in my many, many workplaces. In fact, Senator O'Farrell, um, I'm pleased to let you know that three— Order. Sorry, Senator. <laughs> Senator Farrell on a point of order. Point, point of order. Uh, I don't wish to be confused with the former uh, uh, Premier of New South Wales. <laughs> Senator Rustin, to continue. Yeah, sorry, maybe, maybe I was actually just saying, oh, Senator Farrell. Um, <laughs> but I'd like to advise people in this place that 3.5 million Australians are actually drug tested every year in the workplace, in the mining industry. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Minister, what sort of targeted support will job seekers who test positive to multiple drug tests be provided? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, as part of the trial, we have set aside $10 million as a treatment fund so that we can make sure that there is capacity in the trial sites for anybody who does test positive to more than one test, will be able to access the treatment that they need to be able to deal with their particular addiction. This is in addition to the $780 million that this government already has committed over the four months to re reduce the impact of drugs on individuals, their families, their communities and Australia. It will be in three parts. Uh, to assist case management for those individuals who find themselves uh, having tested more than once positive. It will be about building the facilities and the services and the treatments to ensure that anybody who does treat positive will have access to the services that they need. And it's also got another individual um, fund to make sure that we as a government are able to get the, the resources to support the facilities in these areas. This is about providing funding to job seekers to Order. deal with their Senator job addiction. Rustin. Senator Farrell. Thank you for getting the name correct, uh, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, the member for Chisholm confirmed in a statement yesterday that she held membership of an organisation linked to China's foreign influence operation, the Guangdong Overseas Exchange Association. Less than 24 hours after telling Sky News she could not recall being part of it, um, what changed? <coughs> Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Sorry, I've just been a little bit distracted by uh, the uh, Senator's uh, leader. Um, as I've. Senator Farrell. Mr. President, I'm happy to. Um, I, I'm happy to repeat the question. If, uh, Unle uh, unless the minister would like the question repeated. <laughs> Order. We, we were, as the question was being uh, read out, we were communicating about some procedure that is apparently to follow. So it would assist if we could have. Please a... feel free to repeat the question, Senator Farrell. <laughs> Do you promise Mr. To it? <laughs> Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The member for Chisholm confirmed in a statement yesterday that she held membership of an organisation linked to, Chinese, to, to China's uh, foreign influence operation, the Guangdong Overseas uh, Exchange Association, less than 24 hours after telling Sky News that she could not recall being part of it. What changed? 
Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, you know, it actually does happen uh, to uh, people when they give interviews that they don't recall all of uh, the events of the past, and that on reflection and on uh, verifying their records and their information, uh, that on becoming uh, aware of the uh, actual uh, facts, uh, they clarify the situation, which is precisely what the member for Chisholm did, uh, which is, of course, the appropriate thing to do. Uh, and, and incidentally, the Labour candidate, also of Chinese origin uh, in the city of Chisholm at the last election, had a similar experience where she equally uh, was, uh, had forgotten or was not aware that she had been made the uh, honorary chairman of a particular uh, organisation, the United Chinese Commerce Association of Australia, and on reflection uh, realised that she had been. Now, you know, the truth of the matter is uh, the member for Chisholm uh, has uh, issued a statement which clarifies all of these matters. This is now just a labour smear. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, I do have one, uh, Mr President. Uh, uh, Ms Liu's uh, statement yesterday also confirmed she held membership of the United Chinese Commerce Association less than 24 hours after denying membership on Sky News. What changed? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. I refer uh, Senator Farrell uh, to uh, my previous answer. And what I also uh, would uh, point out uh, is uh, that uh, the member for Chisholm, like her challenger from the Labour Party at the last election, were actively involved uh, in the uh, Chinese community in Australia. And the smear that uh, the Labour Party is pursuing against the member for Chisholm uh, is a smear against all 1.2 million Australians of Chinese descent. And order. The Labor Party Senator Cormann. Senator Wong on a point of order. I would ask that that be withdrawn. Um, it cannot, well, it cannot possibly be a smear, and it is it's, never. That I, I, is an inappropriate thing for the minister to say. I, I can, whether I appreciate that, Senator Wong, you may um, challenge what the minister said, but as, and I will correct, I'll come to the chamber and correct it if I'm incorrect. But off the top of my head, I don't believe that was an, an unparliamentary reflection on any individual member of parliament, nor unparliamentary language. My name is Wong. Well, no, I, I, we have traditionally, Senator Wong, required more specificity when it comes to unparliamentary reflections. That was a statement in the broad. I appreciate it may be a, a debating point. I will check the Hansard and precedent and come back to the chamber if I'm different. But we've always had the view that general statements, for example, about a group of people in a political party, um, can be said that if they were said about one person, would, would meet um, the test that requires withdrawal as unparliamentary language. Senator Cormann. Oh, Senator Keneally. It is incomprehensible what Senator Cormann is alleging that Senator Wong, as a Chinese Australian, would perpetrate a smear on herself. That is what he is alleging here. Uh, Quite frankly, Order. Mr. President, I ask you to review your ruling. I ask you to review your ruling. Senator Cormann has specifically said that the questions that the opposition have legitimately posed today about reports relating to foreign interference to a specific member of parliament, he has extrapolated that to the Labour Party communist smear across all Chinese Australians, and that would include Senator Wong, and it is an incomprehensible and absurd position to assert that that does not apply to Senator Wong. Um, on, can I, or is this on the point of order, Senator point Canavan? Of order. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, I think you've been quite liberal during this question time, as the as the opposition has pursued a number of questions raising imputations about a member of the other chamber, and we've accept, we've answered those questions, we've taken those questions, and I think you've been right to liberally apply that. Now, for the Labor Party to be so defensive, so defensive on, on, about a general I'll, I'll point, a general point okay. here is not appropriate at all, and not a consistent application of these standards during this question time. If this point was um, to be upheld. I, 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 I gave him the same generosity I provided Senator Keneally on, on the issue of the point of order that Senator Keneally raised. I will, as I've said, review the exact words Senator Cormann used, but even in the words you restated, which if they were the words he used, in my view, and again I'll correct it if the precedent directs me otherwise, um, a general comment of that nature does not qualify as unparliamentary or, a, or an imputation or reflection upon an individual. We have traditionally required that it be more specific about a person. Uh, it may be a legitimate debating point, but I do not believe it is unparliamentary. I'll happily correct myself if I'm wrong. Um, we were up to. Had you concluded your answer, Senator Cormann? Yep. So up to Senator Farrell's final supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I do have one. 
Uh, given every answer from Ms Liu raises more questions, when will the Prime Minister assure the parliament and the Australian people that she is a fit and proper person to be a member of the Australian parliament? Senator Corbyn. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. I completely reject the premise of the question. Uh, and uh, furthermore, uh, the member for Chisholm has been validly elected as the member for Chisholm by the people of Chisholm. Uh, that is something the Labor Party cannot accept. And as I've already indicated, Order. the Prime Minister has full confidence uh, in the member for Chisholm. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. Yeah. Um, Senator Wong, I had a minister seeking to add to an answer. No? Okay. Well, Senator, the opposition leader takes precedence. I thank the Senator. I seek leave to move a motion relating to an explanation from the minister representing the Prime Minister. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Pursuant to contingent notice, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as it would prevent me moving a motion relating to consideration of a matter, namely a motion relating to an explanation from the minister representing the Prime Minister. Uh, and this is a motion which, if passed, will require Senator Cormann, on behalf of the Prime Minister, to come in on Monday at 12.20 to provide an assurance to the Senate that he refused on multiple occasions to give today, and that is the assurance from the government and the Prime Minister that the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to remain a member of the Australian Parliament. Mr President, this government is failing in its most important duty, and that is to assure Australians that it is properly and sensibly and apolitically managing Australia's national security. For weeks now, questions have been raised over whether the member for Chisholm's connections make her a fit and proper person to be in our parliament. And in an effort to address the questions, she gave a television interview, a very famous television interview. But the problem is her answers simply raised more questions. And in an attempt to deal with those new questions, the Prime Minister's office wrote a press release that was issued in the member for Chisholm's name. And when that in turn raised new questions about why the member for Chisholm's statements are so wildly inconsistent, the Prime Minister then gave a press conference where he claimed that the only thing that has happened is that the member for Chisholm has given a somewhat clumsy interview. He's claimed that there is no credible suggestion of any inappropriate behaviour in relation to the member for Chisholm. Well, patently, that is untrue. Because this morning Australia woke to an extraordinary report in a number of newspapers that senior Liberals were warned by security agencies that concerns about the member for Chisholm's links to the Chinese Communist Party made it unwise to pre-select her. This is not the Labor Party asserting this. This is a public report in a newspaper, and it needs to be responded to by the government. It needs to have a response by the government, a response that is more than hyperbole and more than bluster and more than aggression and actually deals with a very serious accusation that is publicly made about a member of this parliament. And the accusation or the assertion that security agencies warn senior Liberals that concerns about Ms, Ch Ms Liu's links to the Communist Party of China made it unwise to pre-select her. It has nothing to do with her interview. It is about whether the Prime Minister is prepared to put winning marginal seats ahead of national security and whether he is now putting his one one-seat majority ahead of national security. Now, one of the government's own MPs is quoted in the, in the papers as saying, and I quote, there should have been concerns when she was chosen to stand, and I believe those concerns were ignored. Well, the Prime Minister should provide an honest answer. But instead of providing an honest answer, and instead of his ministers who have responsibility uh, for, to, for national security and who sit on the shadow in it, the, the NSC, providing an honest answer. This government, this Prime Minister, is playing clever tricks on race. I will say this. There is only one person who is making these specific and serious concerns about the member of, for Chisholm an issue about race, and that is Scott Morrison. There is only one person who is linking these specific, serious concerns about the member for Chisholm to the entire Chinese-Australian population, and that is Mr Morrison. This is the Prime Minister who is using this issue as a shield 
from accountability to the parliament and the Australian people. The Prime Minister, who is hiding behind the entire Chinese Australian community to avoid saying what he has ignored, to avoid saying why he has ignored warnings from our national security agencies. And Mr President, can I say that is one of the lowest acts I have seen in all my time in this place, that you would use Chinese Australians in order to avoid answering questions about why you are ignoring advice from national security agencies. Because of what the Prime Minister has done, it is more important than ever for Chinese Australians and our inclusive democracy for these specific concerns to be addressed. Because all of us, all of us in this place must be able to provide a public assurance that we have no conflict of interest in serving the Australian people. That is a basic democratic requirement. And I would say to the Minister, if you avoid this, if you avoid, uh, this uh, motion, if you avoid coming in to give a statement that provides the assurance that you and Senator Payne have repeatedly declined to give, that she is a fit, Ms. Ms Liu is a fit and proper person to sit in this parliament, it really says that you do not understand the role you have in this Order, democracy. Order, Senator Wong. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I mean, this is just a complete stunt. I'll tell you why it's a stunt. Because what I'm asked to be doing at 12.20 uh, p.m. on Monday is what I do every day in question time, every single day. And you know what? I mean, what I, the answer I'll be providing at 12.20 uh, p.m. on Monday, if this motion were to get up, would be the same answer as I would be giving, uh, giving to any question asked in question time. It's a stunt that is part of a political strategy. And Senator Wong let the cut out of the bag when she said this is about a one-seat majority. She let the cut out of the bag because this is all about Labor somehow thinking that despite the verdict of the Australian people at the last election, they can somehow find a way to sneak themselves back in into contention to get into government. That is what this is all about. I mean, look, so, so, so as part of a smear, what do you do when you bring up a smear? What do you do when you pursue a smear? You refer to media reports, media reports. Right? And we know how media reports can, can happen. And, uh, and as it happens, the ABC published an article titled Australian Liberal MP Gladys Liu links to secretive United Front Chinese influence arm. And as it turns out, as it turns out, Ms. Liu's Labour opponent at the last election, Jennifer Yang, was also a member of the same organisation. Now, do you think that Senator Wong would be asking me these same questions uh, if, uh, if the uh, Labour candidate had been successful and if she was the Foreign Minister of Australia right now? No, she would not. No, she would not. This is hypocrisy writ large. This is political opportunism and hypocrisy writ large, and it will not do you any favours whatsoever. I mean, it is true that uh, Gladys Liu has been very active in the uh, Chinese community in Australia, like many other uh, Chinese Australians. And, and indeed, like the uh, Labour candidate in Chisholm at the last election appears to have been, that is no reason. That is no reason to do uh, to a newly elected member of parliament the Labour Party is doing now. There is only one reason why you are doing uh, what you are doing, and that is because you think that somehow that could get you one seat closer to the prize that you thought you had already won, but that, was, that turned out to be uh, not available for you because the Australian people made a judgment that they preferred our plan to build a stronger economy to your politics of envy, socialist agenda. Uh, that would have made Australia uh, poorer and Australians poorer and weaker. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, President, uh, we will not be uh, supporting uh, this uh, uh, motion, this suspension motion. And I might just also say that Gladys Liu and Jennifer Yang were made honorary chairwoman of the United Chinese Commerce Association of Australia at the same time. Uh, and indeed, the Labour candidate, uh, uh, Ms. Yang, attended the same World Trade United Foundation sponsored event in Melbourne in August 2017, appearing on stage, seated in the back row, along with Bruce Atkinson and Gladys Liu. Labour's candidate in Chisholm, Jennifer Yang, said she did not recall being formally appointed an, an honorary chairwoman at the United Chinese Commerce Association of Australia. And incidentally, is that the association that took the then shadow treasurer Chris Bowen to China? Is that, is that the same association? I mean, this is, this is just this is the lowest of the low. The Labour Party should hang their heads in shame uh, in, in terms of how you are pursuing this. You should absolutely hang uh, your heads in shame. 
um, and, and of course, I mean, I could, I could go uh, through uh, more of the uh, 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 parallels to just demonstrate the absolute hypocrisy, the absolute hypocrisy uh, in Labour pursuing this. This is, this is, this is not. I mean, this is confected. This is confected interest uh, about somehow uh, having national security-related concerns. You don't have national security-related concerns in relation to the member for Chisholm. Uh, you know, you know, you know that that is completely inappropriate for you. Uh, there's absolutely completely inappropriate for you to pursue it uh, the way you're pursuing this. Uh, and, and again, I mean, I think that everyone in this chamber knows what this is about. Uh, this is about the Labour Party having lost a seat that you thought you already had in your pocket. You were, I mean, you were so confident in the up to the last election. Not only, not only had you already measured the carpets and the curtains in the lodge, you had, already, you had the removalist vans ready to go. You had the removalists ready to go, to move in. I mean, and, and now here you are, here you are, uh, you haven't, you haven't, you, you didn't get there because the people of Chisholm, the majority of the people of Chisholm preferred our candidate uh, and preferred our agenda for a stronger economy, more jobs and to keep Australians safe and secure compared to the alternative. And that is, that is, you can't get over it. That is, you can't get over it. I mean, you know what, if, if you want to be, if you want to be competitive at the next election, if you want to be competitive at the next election, you've got to get yourself to stage seven of the seven stages of grief, and that is acceptance. Acceptance of the verdict of the Australian people is going to be a prerequisite for you to be able to be competitive in the lead up to the last election. This is a disgraceful stunt. Whether I'm appearing at 12.20 p.m. on Monday or at 2 p.m. on Monday, the answers will be the same. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise today in support of the motion to suspend standing orders. What we have seen this week is extraordinary. There have been numerous reports this week about the member for Chisholm, her political affiliations, her contacts, her fundraising. There have even been reports that ASIO was so concerned by the member for Chisholm's conduct that they warned the Prime Minister's office and others in the Liberal Party against pre-selecting her. Yet the Liberal Party allowed her to be pre-selected and ultimately elected to this parliament. In fact, according to one source, a source from the intelligence community apparently told a senior party official that, we can't tell you what to do, but we don't think it would be a good idea. Unbelievable. These reports occur today in the media. The opposition does what an opposition should rightly do and question whether those reports are true, put those questions to the elected government, and what do they do? They hide behind smears and, and accusations of racism. They hide behind statements that she was elected. Yes, she was elected, but did the people of Chisholm know what the Liberal Party is reported to have known? what the Prime Minister of the day was reported to have known, and that is that our security agencies, our national security agencies, had serious concerns about the member for Chisholm's links to the Chinese Communist Party, concerns that they were so oh, found so alarming that they felt the need to bring to the attention of the Liberal Party and of the Prime Minister. I have to say, the only thing that is more extraordinary than the alleged behaviour of the member for Chisholm is the current behaviour of this Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance, the leader of the government in this chamber, and their colleagues. It is beyond shameful to hear the Prime Minister and others claim that fair scrutiny on the member for Chisholm, much of it by the hard-working members of our national intelligence community, is somehow an act of racism. What an astonishing statement from this Liberal government. Let's not forget, these are the same Liberals who voted in this chamber for the It's OK to be White motion. Let's not forget, these are the same Liberals who rushed to shake the hand of Fraser Anning after he cited the final solution in his first speech. Let's not forget, this is the same Liberal government whose Home Affairs Minister claims that Melburnians are too scared to go out at night due to the African gang violence, and that the Fraser government made mistakes bringing in people from Lebanese Muslim background in the 1970s. For this lot, 
to get up and hurl accusations of racism at the opposition for simply raising legitimate questions about whether or not it is true that national security agencies raised concerns about the member for Chisholm and they were ignored by this liberal government. It just goes to show that this is all about their ducking and weaving. They were given opportunities. By Senator, Senator Payne was asked by Senator Kitching. Senator Corman was asked twice, once by Senator Wong and once by Senator Farrell, to utter four simple words that the member for Chisholm was a fit and proper person to serve in this parliament. They did not do it. The, member for, uh, the foreign minister, Senator Payne, got up and pretended she had said those words. What she actually said is it offensive to raise the suggestion. She never uttered those words. Minister Corman never uttered those words. And that is what is most telling here. The fact that they know they cannot stand in this chamber and assert beyond a reasonable doubt with confidence and give assurance to the Australian people that the member for Chisholm is in fact a fit and proper person to serve in this chamber. Had they done that today in question time, we wouldn't need to have moved this suspension of standing orders. We wouldn't need to have moved this motion, but yet they failed to do it. These are legitimate questions, serious allegations being raised in the nation's media. The Prime Minister of this country, Minister Cormann, as his representative in this chamber, owe it to this parliament and to the Australian people to explain the member for Chisholm's conduct, to answer the allegations that national security agencies have raised concerns about her connections, and ensure us that she is indeed fit and proper to represent her constituents. Order. Senator Payne. Mr. President, and, uh, Mr. President, still we don't have an answer from those opposite. We have no answer from those opposite about what they are actually saying. So what they are claiming, Mr. President, is to have seen media reports which they are citing. They have quoted them at length. They are asking questions about, uh, apparently about security agency advice. Mr President, I would suggest, though, that they might want to refer to the words of the former Attorney General, the member for Isaacs, I think, uh, where he has said, as Attorney General, the then Attorney General refused to confirm or deny the report, a report in relation to an ASIO matter, citing a long-standing government policy of declining to comment on security matters. That's apparently described by those opposite now as some sort of shield, but in fact it is an appropriate and, and well-recognised way for, appropriate, for governments to address security and intelligence matters. He went on in another article at the same time, 2013, to say, I'm not going to comment on operational matters involving the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation or any security matters, Mr President. So when they say that government should publicly debate these issues, they are completely walking away from their own standards, and I use that word advisedly in relation to the Labor Party, but completely walking away from their own standards. Mr President, the member for Chisholm has made a clear public statement of multiple paragraphs, Mr. President, which the Prime Minister indicated this morning we would be pleased to, to place on the parliamentary record. Three of those paragraphs, Mr. President, relate apparently to associations in Australia with which the member for Chisholm was previously involved. But she is not the only person to have been engaged in recent political activity to have been associated with those groups, Mr. President. In fact, the Labor candidate for Chisholm, as others have said in this chamber today, was also an office holder and a member of those organisations. Two in particular. As the Attorney General has pointed out in the House of Representatives today, the member for McMahon has accepted hospitality and travel from those organisations, Mr. President. Does that make him what they are claiming that the member for Chisholm is? I actually think not, Mr President, but we would not seek to smear the member for McMahon in the way that those opposite are endeavouring to smear a member of parliament with their behaviours. Yesterday, Senator Wong attempted to draw a some degree of moral equivalence between the member for Chisholm and former Labor Senator Dastiari. But, Mr President, there is none. None. In fact, it is extraordinary to suggest that there would be, and let's be clear about why that is the case. Everybody knows that the former Labor Senator for New South Wales accepted funds for his own accounts and payments from 
uh, other, uh, other Australians, or other people, I should say, Mr. President, backed, uh, who paid his bills when he went over his parliamentary travel budget, who settled a private legal matter for him. They know that he stood next to uh, the individual concerned at a press conference in Commonwealth parliamentary offices in support of the Chinese government's refusal to abide by international court rulings on disputed territory in the South China Sea, Mr. President. And those opposites seek to equate a moral equivalence between that sort of behaviour and the, uh, the um, member for Chisholm. It is absolutely extraordinary. But I'll tell you what's really extraordinary, Mr. President, to have to sit in this chamber and listen to a member of the New South Wales Labor Party lecture anyone else about political associations, about contact and about fundraising. Because, Mr. President, I don't know where those opposite get their Aldi bags, but we know what they do with them. Yeah. And, Mr. President, I don't know how those opposite can claim to be on some high moral ground about political associations and contacts when members of their former government are serving prison sentences for their behaviour. It is absolutely extraordinary. And I don't know how those opposite, Mr. President. I don't know how those opposite, Mr. President, can claim any moral virtue on this subject and order. around racism. Senator Wong, when on a point their of own order. Leaders... Senator Wong has risen on a point of order. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Rather than interrupt debate, I wonder if you could look at the minister's contribution and make a decision subsequently as to whether there were aspects of that which are clearly the sorts of imputations with the standing orders prohibit and, and consider the appropriateness of asking the minister to substitute. So I don't want to get into do so. uh, I don't want to get into an argument now. I just ask I just okay. would ask you to consider that. I, yeah, on the point of order, Senator Payne. Point of order, Mr President. If you chose to take the point of order of the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate on considering the Hansard in relation to imputations, then could I please ask that you also consider the Hansard in relation to all of the imputations those opposite have endeavoured to make about the member for Chisholm? Well on, the, on the point of order, the, the order, if I could rule, if I could rule on the point of order, Senator Reynolds, Senator Wong, Senator Payne, order! Please. On the issue of imputations, this chamber has slipped a very long way over my decade here uh, when, during question time, uh, where imputations and improper motives are assigned to people and asking of some questions. When it comes to a member of another place or another parliament or a member of the judiciary, we have traditionally applied much stricter standards. Um, I will always take a request from any senator to review the Hansard of a debate to see if there was something that was inappropriate. If it is, I will approach senators and deal with it that way before I bring it back to the chamber. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. Let me conclude by saying I will not be lectured and we will not be lectured by those on the other side, particularly those from the New South Wales Labor Party, the party of Luke Foley and White Flight, the party of Michael Daly claiming Asians with PhDs are taking the jobs of young Sydney siders, young Australians. That is hypocrisy in the extreme, Mr President, and not entirely surprised. The question is, Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr President, I indicate that Senator Alliance will support uh, the, the substantive motion, but not the suspension of standing orders. The question is, the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Sorry, I'm putting the motion moved by Senator Wong to suspend standing orders. The question is, that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McCarthy, teller for the ayes, and Senator Smith, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 35, noes 35. The matter is therefore negative. We'll now resume. Before we go to take note, I understand there are a couple of ministers seeking the call to add to answers. I'll start with Senator Rustin. I seek leave. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to uh, correct a statement that I made during question time. Oh, you don't need leave, oh, Minister. Okay. Look, thank you. Um, during question time, it's been brought to my attention that I inadvertently left two words out of a sentence. Um, my sentence should have read, people on welfare who take drugs are denying themselves the best opportunity of taking advantage of jobs. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Canavan. Uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, I'd like to correct a, a statement I made during question time yesterday in relation to gas prices. I said that the spot gas price in Brisbane fell to $5.16 a gigajoule last month. However, I meant to say that the price had fallen by $5.16 a gigajoule last month. Last month, they averaged $6.99 a gigajoule in Brisbane. Thank you, Senator Cannon and Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'd just like to add additional information to an answer I gave uh, to Senator Faruqi today. I've been advised there was a report in the media relating to an FOI request submitted by the RSPCA on the 22nd of May 2019. Um, all FOI requests submitted to the department are managed in accordance with the FOI Act 1982 and guidance material issued by the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, including consideration of examination from access. On multiple occasions, the department has invited the RSPCA to refine the scope of their requests for video footage to reduce the resource burden on the department. In the case of this most recent request, after undertaking relevant third-party consultations, the decision-maker decided to refuse access to the footage on the basis that the disclosure of the footage would or could unreasonably affect organisations in respect of their lawful business affairs and that it would be contrary in the public interest to disclose the information. That decision is currently the subject of an internal review process and it's not appropriate to comment on the matter further until that process has been completed. Thank, thank you, you, Minister. So there, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Farrell. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers given by the government senators uh, to questions asked by Labor senators. Thank you, Senator um, What sort of parallel universe is this government uh, living in at the moment, uh, Deputy uh, President? Um, they're trying to say that uh, we have um, <coughs> the Labor Party is seeking to smear uh, Ms. Uh, Liu. <coughs> well, let's look at the facts. What did the uh, 
uh, Andrew Proben uh, from the ABC, a very good journalist, uh, report this morning. He reported Gladys Liu's association with Chinese figures who were deemed a security risk was the subject of an ASIO investigation even before she entered parliament or became a Liberal candidate. Mr Proben goes on to say, the ABC understands ASIO Director General Duncan Lewis advised the then Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, based on a guest list, uh, should not attend a meet and greet organised by Ms Liu in the Victorian electorate of Chisholm for the Chinese New Year in February 2018. Um, now, if that doesn't ring some alarm bells uh, in this government, uh, what does? But there's more. There's more, Deputy uh, President. Uh, the West Australian uh, today <clears throat> says the Morrison government is under pressure to launch a full-blown investigation into the Chinese Australian MP Gladys Liu's links to Beijing, and even its own parliamentarians are voicing concerns. So this is not the Labor Party making smears against uh, Ms Liu. This is members of the, op uh, of the government on the other side making it very clear that they have got concerns about uh, Mrs Liu's uh, um, connections with, uh, with the Chinese government. The report goes on to say a handful of Liberal MPs last night told the Western Australian they wanted a full probe into their colleague to ensure her loyalties were not divided between Australia and China. Uh, this is not an ordinary Section 44 um, <coughs> issue, uh, Deputy President. Section 44 has often been used in the last parliament uh, to knock, knock uh, members of parliament out who had dual citizenship. But if you go on and read about um, Section 44, it talks about your allegiances. And of course, what these Liberal MPs are doing is raising serious questions about the allegiance of Ms Gladys Liu. Now, if that wasn't enough uh, to uh, spark uh, some interest or some inquiry on the part of the, uh, the government, uh, then um, can I uh, refer to Ms Liu's, <coughs> sorry, uh, Ms. Liu's own uh, comments on the Bolt um, show um, the, uh, the, other, uh, the other evening? It's not a show I customarily uh, watch, but she was asked pretty simple questions pretty simple questions about whether or not uh, she attended um, and was a member of a number of functions, <coughs> a, a number of organisations, including uh, China's United Front <coughs> organisation, uh, an organisation that um, uh, apparently um, acts on behalf of uh, the China, uh, Chinese government, a uh, propaganda organisation for the Chinese, uh, Chinese government. And of course, what do we see? Um, what do we see? Well, we see a photograph. Now, this is this is on the 14th of August. Uh, the ABC uh, deputy president uh, published photographs of uh, Miss uh, um, Gladys Liu, uh, with amongst other people, <coughs> uh, the founder of the Bema Azo uh, and the Chinese United Front coordinator. Um, the night she does the Bolt interview, she can't remember, doesn't know whether she's a member of this uh, organisation. She's got a photograph, lovely photograph on her, uh, I assume it's on her web page or the web page of the uh, organisation itself, uh, that makes it very clear uh, that she's a participant in this organisation uh, and that uh, she's fully prepared to uh, make it clear that uh, she, uh, she is a participant in that organisation. Now, if all of those things uh, aren't enough for uh, this government to start uh, questioning um, the issue, then, then I don't know what is, Deputy President. What do you need? Uh, you've got the De Director General of ASIO saying, look, don't, don't pre-select this candidate. You've got her confused. <coughs> confused about whether she is or isn't a member of these organisations, uh, and now you've got all of these Liberal Party, Liberal Party MPs saying there's question marks about this lady. Let's have an investigation. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator Van. I think that, 
Thank you, Madam Deputy it, President. Sen yes, sorry, Senator Farrell. I'll just, my apology, Senator Farrell. I called you, Senator Ross, and it's not your day today. My apologies. Please continue, Senator Van. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. And I rise in support of my colleague in the other place, Gladys Liu. She's my friend and colleague, and I have absolute faith in her and her ability to do her job in this place. You don't know that, Senator Farrell, so why don't you table it? Why don't you put up or just be quiet while I'm speaking? So, Mr. Senator Farrell raised the, the point of parallel universes. Well, let's point out a few. The Labor candidate uh, for the, the seat of Chisholm was a member of the same, same things. Ms. Senator Farrell, I was quiet while you were speaking, despite some Order. of the despicable things you were saying. So I ask you to be quiet. Order. I believe it is. You're wrong. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Senator Van, so, please resume your seat. Senator Smith, on a point of order. Point of order, Madam Deputy President. Senator Farrell, of all people, know what conduct is required of senators in this particular part of the day. I just ask you to call him to order. Thank you. I remind all senators that remarks must be made to the chair and that interjections are disorderly and people have the right to be heard in silence. Senator Farrell. Point of order. I, um, I reject the suggestions that anything I said was despicable. Um, all of the things I said uh, were um, issues that have been reported uh, in reputable newspapers uh, <coughs> around this country. Senator Farrell, that's a debating point. I've uh, reminded senators of the way that we conduct ourselves according to the standing orders. Please continue. Senator Van. Yes, thank you, Madam Deputy President. The, the member for Chisholm is, is an absolutely suitable uh, person to be a member of this parliament. And she was elected by the people of Chisholm. So you know, when we look at Ms Lou, she's an outstanding Australian. She came here as a migrant. And I point out to the chamber that Ms Lou is a migrant from Hong Kong. Now, it might be lost on those on the other side about what's been happening in Hong Kong recently. So to the point that, she, that Ms Lu might be a member of the Chinese Communist Party, which I think they're trying to allege, is absolutely wrong. She came here as a migrant and has done exceptionally well. Her work as a speech pathologist is well known and well understood. So her, her work um, you know, that she's done throughout her community in being members of community groups, which were members that other people have, shouldn't be lost on them. And we should also note that all these allegations, what are they going to do to people, other migrants, especially other migrant women, who are deciding, well, should I take up a place in public life? Should I stand in politics if I'm going to cop this sort of abuse from those from the other side? It's absolutely disgraceful. Now, many Australians have migrants have de dedicated their lives to the betterment of their community within Australia. And I believe it is offensive that someone of the standing of Gladys Lou has been unfairly questioned about her allegiance to Australia. We should not doubt the superior loyalty of commitments of migrants to Australia, but instead we should recognise their contributions to our political system. Gladys Lou was one such migrant. She did grow up in Hong Kong. Remember that. Please, senators, remember she grew up in Hong Kong and migrated from Hong Kong. Gladys, yes, she has come out and saying that, I believe. Gladys immigrated to Australia and has worked tirelessly to forward, to put, to forward the purpose of the integration of Chinese migrants into Australian society. And there is no doubt in my mind that Gladys is an exceptional, and, an exceptional individual and an exceptional Australian. In my maiden speech, I discussed the value of Australia's democracy. And I must say, the attitude of some towards our first ever elected Chinese member of parliament is incongruous with the democracy I know and love. Now, Gladys Liu has faced extreme criticism, in, including ongoing from Senator Farrell at this point in time, for her associations with two organisations in particular. However, I ask, should all those organisations be different to any other organisation that non-Chinese and current former parliamentarians have also been a part of? 
Have these non-Chinese Australians faced similar rebuke? There is a double standard here that needs to be highlighted. You know, from my home state of Victoria, earlier this year, the Labor Premier, Dan Andrews, was in China attending Belt and Road Forum. We can assume that Dan accepted hospitality at this event or throughout his travels from a foreign government. And this is to be expected. This is natural. But would the perception of Dan's tour be under challenge if he was a Chinese Australian? Well, unfortunately, after what I think we've seen today, I don't think it would be. Um, as we heard earlier, the member for McMahon, you know, he's been he accepted travel from the Australian Guangdong Chamber of <coughs> Commerce over his five-day trip to Hong Kong and China. Now, if he was a Chinese Australian, would he get the same treatment that Miss Lu is? I believe Miss Lu is a very solid Australian and is a very proper person to be in this place. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Deputy President. Serving as a senator or indeed as a member of the other place is quite an undertaking and requires of us to make decisions in this place on the basis of what is in the best interests of our community. In doing so, it is incumbent upon us to make those decisions without conflict or undue influence for any party, least of all from overseas interests. Over the course of many weeks, now we have heard successive reports in the media regarding the member for Chisholm. Story after story, it was all piling up, and questions about her suitability to sit as a member of this parliament became more and more pressing. In an effort to release the mounting pressure, the honourable member in the other place decided to join Andrew Bolt on Sky to clear the air. I can only assume, Deputy President, that in doing so, the member for Chisholm was advised, probably by the Prime Minister's office, that Bolt would give her an easy run. A quick 15-minute appearance, some softball questions, and all will be well. How wrong were they? How wrong they were indeed. Three times she was asked and failed to commit to Australia's bipartisan position on China's behaviour in the South China Sea. Over and over, she failed to explain her associations with numerous organisations, all of various serious concern. The next day, she issued a statement which featured a spectacular about face. Suddenly, the story changed. The questionable organisations all remembered and the chairmanships suddenly recalled. We've since learned through diligent reporting of some senior Liberals being warned about our nation's own security agencies, it's been alleged by them, that the member for Chisholm's links with the Communist Party uh, with the Chinese Communist Party. Were those warnings that were given to senior Liberals heeded? Did the Liberal put the alleged advice of our security agencies ahead of their own ambitions to win the seat of Chisholm at the last federal election? Well, in the words of one government MP, as quoted in the article today, I believe those concerns were ignored. Now, the question becomes, why doesn't the Prime Minister and members of his government stand before the House of Representatives or the representatives in this place stand in this chamber and declare that the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to sit in this parliament? What are those opposite afraid of? What do they know that we don't know? Because I'll tell you what we do know, Madam President. We know that there are reports that the member for Chisholm is a member of organisations that are of serious concern because of their links to the Chinese Communist Party. We know that it is alleged in the papers yesterday and today that senior Liberals were advised that it would be, quote, unwise to pre-select her. We also know that the Prime Minister proudly declared back in April of this year that how good is Gladys? 
And after today, Madam, Pres Madam Deputy President, I can say that we know one more thing. We know that there are a lot of folks on the other side that would probably want to see their time again in pre-selecting the member for Chisholm. All parliamentarians must be able to provide an assurance that they have no conflict of interest in serving the Australian people, whether it be here in the Senate or in the other place. It is up to the Prime Minister to demonstrate to the parliament and to the Australian people and the people in the electorate of Chisholm in my home state of Victoria that the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to sit in the Australian parliament. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Chandler. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And in rising today to take note of uh, the responses that we had from government ministers to questions from the opposition um, during question time, I must say um, this is just another example uh, of Labor, of this Labor opposition demonstrating that they have no plan uh, and no policy agenda which they can talk about. They've taken up hours of this chamber's time today um, talking about, about, you know, talking about something that is not, you know, part of any positive or even consistent, coherent plan um, for what they might do for Australia. And after all, isn't that what we're here for uh, in this place, Madam Deputy President, uh, to debate policy and enact a plan which delivers for Australians uh, on the things that, that matter to them? But that's not what Labor does in this parliament uh, because they don't have a plan and they can't agree on their policy agenda. Uh, and that, that's certainly what we've seen as evidence here today. In relation to uh, this, this idea, this, um, this issue that Labor is trying to push um, regarding the member for Chisholm, as has been pointed out today, uh, Labor's own shadow health minister uh, has travelled to China on a delegation paid for by the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, if, if Labor thinks that it is worth the Senate's time to make these sorts of assertions, uh, then why not focus on, on the member for McMahon? Um, I'm not saying necessarily that we should. I'm, I'm just saying you know, I, I think that there are far more important things for this place to be debating. Um, but all I'm saying is that perhaps uh, our friends on the other side should consider a little bit of consistency and should consider whether they are being consistent in raising this issue today. Um, or even focus on their own candidate in the seat for Chisholm. Um, and again, it's an issue of consistency that we are talking about here. Um, their own candidate for Chisholm, I understand, was a member of at least two of the organisations that the, uh, the, the uh, current member for Chisholm has been a member of. So, again, absolute inconsistency um, from the opposition on this point. Uh, Madam Deputy President, I think there are many better things that the Senate could be discussing today um, with its time like the plan that, that this Morrison coalition government has to create jobs and grow the economy. In fact, I think I could settle for something less than that. I think I could just settle for Labor putting forward their own alternative to what that might be, because at least then we can have an appropriate contest of ideas, and a, a contest in this place about how we think this country should be run. Um, the Morrison government has our plan. Uh, the opposition, unfortunately, is, is yet to come up with any consistent or coherent narrative about how they see uh, this country progressing. And as Minister Cormann said today, uh, Madam Deputy President, it's because they're spiralling through the many stages of grief um, as a result of their loss at the election on the 18th of May, the election that they thought they were going to run, that they were going to win rather. Um, as opposed to this government, where you have seen a plan, uh, a plan that we took to the election, a plan that was endorsed resoundingly by the Australian people on the 18th of May, um, and a government that is steadfastly getting on with the job of implementing that plan. And that's why I'm so disappointed, uh, Madam Deputy President, that we have spent today 
um, not focused on these issues, not focused on the issues that matter to the people of Australia, um, to the people in my own state of Tasmania, who I, I'm sure might be you know, listening in today and, and wondering what on earth the Senate is doing with its time. But the best thing you can say about the Labor Party at the moment is that, at least if you don't agree with their position on, on one issue today, then they might change their mind tomorrow. Tomorrow they might have something else to say um, in complete contradiction to what they've been saying today. Uh, so perhaps I shouldn't be surprised that there are inconsistencies around their rhetoric today um, in terms of the member for Chisholm in comparison with uh, perhaps members of their own party, because if they can't be consistent on this issue, um, then we can't trust them to come up with any sort of consistent agenda for how they think that this country should progress. It's more of the same old, same old from the opposition. Uh, Senator Ayres. Uh, I also rise to take note of uh, questions and answers in today's question time. These are very serious questions indeed and raise very serious issues not just for the member for Chisholm uh, but also for the Prime Minister and the government and the political judgment of the Liberal Party in Victoria. The questions surrounding the Minister for Chisholm's suitability to sit in the parliament go to the heart of the electorate's distrust and disillusionment and despair at the state of contemporary <coughs> politics. In case anybody hasn't been listening, Australians have uh, started to lose confidence in their elected representatives and whether or not they're acting in their interests. Is it any wonder? The efforts in today's question time to not answer questions or to obscure the real questions uh, to try and give rise to an apprehension that the Labor Party's questions today were directed at the capacity of, uh, of, a, of all of the people uh, of a particular community in Australia um, are really a misrepresentation of the position, but more seriously a misunderstanding of those opposites' responsibilities uh, and the responsibilities of government to act in the best interests of national security. For weeks, questions have been asked about the member for Chisholm's suitability to sit in the Australian parliament. Every answer from the member for Chisholm to these questions begs more questions. Uh, it's a smokescreen, the last refuge for, to, for a sort of careless reference to national security. Um, what is required here is precision, an understanding of people's responsibilities. Uh, the questions go to, was Ms Liu, the member for Chisholm, a member of organisations or an honorary office bearer of organisations that are part of the foreign influence activities of the Chinese government? Is this true? Uh, did she declare her membership of these organisations uh, or did she obscure her membership of these organisations? Did the Prime Minister know? Was he warned about it by the security agencies or other agencies? If the Prime Minister knew, what did he do about it? Now, in an effort to clear her name, the member for Chisholm agreed to an interview with Andrew Bolt on Sky on Tuesday night. It's not necessarily where I'd go uh, in an effort uh, to clarify things, but that's where she went. The interview was a train wreck. It wasn't the clumsy effort of a first-term backbencher. Uh, we could all make those mistakes. The member for Chisholm couldn't explain her membership of numerous organisations of concern. She couldn't recall any other she, she could recall during the election every other aspect of her CV, uh, but she couldn't recall or explain uh, those memberships. She failed on three occasions to commit herself to the bipartisan position to the Australian national position on the South China Sea. Uh, yesterday, she issued a statement to clear, in an effort to clear her name. The reports are that the statement was prepared by the Prime Minister's office. 
On Tuesday night, she couldn't recall her associations. Less than 24 hours later, she was completely clear. What's changed? I think people are entitled to know, and more, in a more serious sense, they're entitled to know what did the Prime Minister know, what did the Victorian Liberal Party know about Ms Liu's previous associations, what did they do to satisfy themselves about whether or not she was a fit and proper person to sit in the Australian Parliament. Now, in question time today, Minister Cormann refused to assure Australians or the Senate that Ms Liu was a fit and proper person to sit in the Australian Parliament. In question time yesterday, uh, Senator Payne refused to assure Australians that Ms Liu was a fit and proper person to sit in the Australian Parliament. It's time the Senate got some Thank answers you, to Senator these questions. Ayres, your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Farrell to take note of all answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. No more taking note of answers.